All right, well, let's uh, get this thing started. Uh, Dan Ritchie, president of the Functional Aging Institute, and uh, Cody Sipe, my great friend and partner, is here with us. In about 10 minutes, we will be introducing uh, our keynote for this morning, Dr. Evan Osar. Uh, but before we get going, we've got a bunch of people to thank, and we kind of want to start with our sponsors and vendors. Uh, the vast majority uh, of them did not bail out on us when we would actually expect that they might do so. Um, you're not having a live event, so why would I have a booth? And Kaiser has stuck with us through thick and thin. We're going to show a promo video of theirs. Um, Alistair has been a great uh, colleague through this. Um, this is their virtual booth, so we strongly encourage you to check it out. They're even offering live meetings, uh, layouts. Um, you can meet with a Kaiser rep register right here to join uh, a live meeting all weekend long. So uh, they want to make this as uh, virtual and live an event as possible. Um, and we have so many other uh, sponsors to thank as well. Uh, Naboso, Dr. Emily Splickle, Curves, PowerPlate, Zibrio, Exercise, etc. Guy Andrews, and both Dr. Katie Forth are speaking later today, uh, as well as Coach Catalyst, Training the Older Adult, Health Evaders, Niche, Pressworks, and Smart Fit. And you can learn more about them just by visiting the Virtual Expo page. So this session is a little bit different than the rest of the day. Um, the rest of the day, you can find the whole schedule uh, up at the top on the online schedule. I know some people are like, where's the sessions? Where's the room? How do I find things? Um, if you go to the online schedule page, you can find everything that is taking place. You will not find the summit on the online schedule, however, you've been emailed that, so you found it if you're here right now. Sue Grant's session is already available. Uh, Leslie Bender's already available. Paul Holbrook's already available, and we are here in the keynote session. Um, so every hour, more sessions are gonna open up. So around uh, 11 o'clock, the breakout sessions will open up. There'll be a button for you to enter any of these five rooms. So choose wisely which session makes the most sense for you. We are recording them all. Um, Cody and Evan, you should probably know that I probably had more questions on this. Well, what if I miss a session or what if I have to go train a client or they're all being recorded. Um, we're recording this session right now. So if you have to leave early, um, you, you have the entirety of this event for as long as the internet uh, will allow us to host it. So for years to come. Functional Aging Summit 2015 is still on here. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Functional Aging Summit 2015 when I introduce Evan. But Cody, do you have anything, uh, opening remarks, anything you want to share before I uh, show Kaiser's video? Yeah, absolutely. I, I just, we appreciate all of you guys uh, being here for this, uh, you know, in this kind of unusual time. And I thank you, we would, uh, you know, be remiss if we didn't just kind of recognize, uh, you know, everything that's going on right now. It's been a crazy six months, you know, and um, so we appreciate you guys being here to learn, to keep upgrading your skills and your knowledge and, and really to be a part of a community as well. You know, that's just so important to have people that you can depend on and rely on other businesses uh, and, and professionals that you're uh, communicating with. Cause I know some of you guys, you know, your businesses are struggling. It's, it's been tough, you know, uh, maybe closing your door, thinking about, well, what am I gonna do next? And uh, a lot of real issues are floating around right now. Um, and we, we just want you guys to, to know that we are, uh, we're here for you. Uh, we wanna support you in any way that we can. Uh, throughout this and look towards what's ahead. That, that's all we can do, you know, right now is say, okay, it is what it is. Uh, things have been out of our control. Let's, let's look forward and let's look, look forward with a positive uh, mindset. And so that's, we're, we're here for that. And that's one thing that I really love about the community of uh, just professionals and just people that have uh, surrounded FAI for the past couple of years. You know, a lot of great people to rely on to be connected to uh, and to really support one another and to learn from. So we will be here for you guys and, and feel uh, free. And we encourage you to reach out to us, uh, not only through this summit, but as we move forward uh, into the future. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Cody's trying his hardest to make me cry. Um, 
but I'm not going to do it right now, uh, maybe after Evan's speaking. Um, but again, um, we're going we're gonna to open this like we normally would at a live conference. We're going to try to make this as true to if we were in the room with you. Um, we, we know we're not. But one of the things I'm going to ask you to do um, is find the Q&A box at the bottom. And I want you to type in where you're tuning in from. Uh, I know we got some folks from New Zealand and Australia tuning in tonight at like 11 uh, p.m. Or, or midnight. Uh, I know already we got some folks from the UK. So find that Q&A box, type in uh, what city, what country, what time zone uh, you're coming to us from. Um, oh my goodness, if you're on here live from Alaska or Hawaii, major kudos to you. Um, and I'm gonna play this, this video. It's a powerful video. Uh, I think it really captures uh, so much of what we're about. And, and I think one of the reasons why Kaiser is such a great uh, premier sponsor for us. Well, I think the worst thing is if somebody looks at an individual and says, oh, they're frail. Frailty is under our control. Yes, of course, you have to work harder at 74. You have to work harder to stay even, but I'm not interested in staying even. I've always believed that you're only as old as you think you are. Society will try to drive you into ageism if it can. I think it's absolute garbage. That would be the number one thing of why I got the, into this and why this exists is seeing the way older adults moved and then just not buying it. And so or at least having a question in my mind like something's not right with that. We can do better. I'm Paul Holbrook. Um, owner and founder of Age Performance here in Salt Lake City, Utah. So the name Age Performance comes from optimizing our performance as we get older. 20% of what we see with aging is genetic, but the other is just lifestyle habits. So, you know, you improve your nutrition, get in the right exercise program, you're gonna you know, limit the effects of aging. Exercising at my age is the fine balance between the physical uh, challenge and also making sure that I'm in as safe an environment as possible. I think the balance issue with seniors is the number one gripe. It's the number one thing that brings them down. It's why they, they stroll around like this. I mean, I'm in personal training because it makes everything else in my life possible. I read better, I play the piano better, I think better, I write better, I do everything better when I'm in shape. Power and speed is the name of the game for this market. And that's why Kaiser is the equipment to use. Well, we've been using Kaiser for about 15 years now, and it's been incredibly safe for us and incredibly effective at the same time. With free weights, when I come down, there's that weight that just goes down. But when you do it with the Kaiser, you still get the weight, you get all that, but you just don't get that kind of jarring effect. The Kaiser equipment gave me that sense of, of uh, smoothness, a, a range of motion in which I could go through that continuous range and come back again without the jolt of uh, traditional exercise equipment. You know, our average age clientele is roughly 70. So we have some 40, 50 year olds, and we have some 80, 90 year olds. I can put everyone in that age group on there. And we all know how this equipment comes and goes anyway, you know, and I think Kaiser's been around long enough and proven, you know, what it is and why it is. I would not want to work out on equipment other than Kaiser. Kaiser allows me to do my work, allowing our clients not to fall into that, allowing our clients to um, move with mobility, with ease, and with vitality, and with a zest for life, because they're able to move better physically and do better. So I see my overall health improved, my strength is better. And uh, you know, I was helping my son a couple months ago uh, relay his stone patio, and I was handling the same stones he was in the same weight 35 years old. I honestly feel right now that I am probably as physically fit now as I've been in my whole life, which I know sounds odd to say at 74, but that's the way I feel about it. You can be a 75-year-old woman, and you can say, I want to pull down as much as Rick is pulling down, and I really am. I'm pretty, pretty competitive. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it goes out of here, too. Yeah.
All right, great stuff. Uh, thanks again to Kaiser. We're gonna kick off our first live session uh, with my great friend, Dr. Evan Osar. Um, I've known about Evan uh, for about eight years now, uh, but I don't think I actually met him until he showed up randomly live at the Functional Aging Summit the very first time in 2015 in Phoenix. And I said, hey, you're, you're Dr. Evan Osar, aren't you? What are you doing here? And he said, I heard about your event and it sounded like something I should be at. And we invited him to our speaker dinner that night and uh, a friendship has developed uh, a relationship and really just a tremendously valuable colleague and asset to the Functional Aging Institute. He wound up keynoting uh, at our 2016 and 2017 summit and has consistently time and time again been one of our most popular speakers. Uh, and so we really couldn't think of anyone uh, more extraordinary uh, to kick off the Functional Aging Summit virtual. Uh, we've got 240 plus people on live right now from multiple countries. Uh, so that's really exciting. So if you don't know Evan personally, um, he's a tremendous, uh, tremendous guy, very generous, uh, very giving of his time. Uh, I see him consistently giving studios his time uh, for free. Um, he, he reminds me that when you ask for something, uh, you never know exactly what you might get. And with Evan, he delivers uh, time and time again. So will you please give a huge round of applause and welcome Dr. Evan Osar to the stage. Please take it away, Evan. Hi, Evan. Woohoo! Thank you for that great introduction. Sorry about that. I missed the end of it, so I apologize. Our internet it was a little shaky here, so if we go out, I truly, truly apologize. We've done our best to get the internet connection just right. So first, I want to just thank Dan and, Rick, Dan and Cody for having me keynote this event. This is a very, these are unprecedented times, and it's a great opportunity to come together as a community, even though we can't be here live. This would have been awesome to be out live in, in Denver, Colorado. However, obviously, recent events preclude that from happening, but it's really an awesome opportunity to gather together as leaders of an industry to help transform this industry and to be the leaders our communities need. And yes, I, I selfishly went to FA High, the first Functional Aging Summit, Summit in Phoenix, Arizona. I was out there writing and I saw that they were putting on the event. And one of my, one of people, people I love in the industry, Deborah Rose, who wrote the book Fall Proof, and she has a balanced program out of California, she was speaking there, so I'm like, I gotta go see her selfishly. And I'm like, oh yeah, then Dan and Cody are gonna be there. I wanna see what the Functional Aging Institute is all about. And when I met Dan, the first thing he said, what are you doing here? He's like, hey, do you wanna come out to dinner tonight, the speaker dinner, would you like to come with me? And instantly I knew there's something different about Dan and Cody. And ever since then, it's been an incredible relationship. I've, you know, Janice and I have loved working with them. Everybody involved with FAI is awesome. This is, outside of our own events, this is the most, wonderful event and opportunity that we have to speak to like-minded individuals who are changing, transforming this industry, serving that older, the active aging population, transforming lives, just, just like you saw in the Kaiser video a little, little while ago. So thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you for all you guys do, Dan and Cody. Um, if, you're, if you're wherever you are, just go give it a woo woo for Dan and Cody for putting this together and bringing us all together here, wherever you are. Thank you so much. Now, So you guys, Dan, can you just give me a thumbs up or something to let me know that you see my screen? Or do I, do I need to share my screen? Oh, there we go. Do you see my screen or do you? Yeah, it's good. Okay, so you see my screen? Okay, cool, thank you. So when I first put this presentation together, I, last year Dan asked me to keynote the event. So the title was Extraordinary, How to Build Superhuman Performance. Now, obviously, the talk was much different than it's gonna to be today. Because then COVID happened three months ago and that created a whole different conversation. And then the recent events around the world in the last week or so has changed this conversation even a little, little bit more. So I wanna share with you how to be extraordinary, the three key principles to being extraordinary. And you don't need for me to share with you how to be extraordinary because you already are extraordinary. But what some of us could use, myself included, is maybe a little boost, a little pat on the back, a little like, let's go get it to help us recognize that extraordinary ability each of us has inside of us. So I'd like to begin with looking at 
individuals that society considers extraordinary. And again, if you think about where Oprah Winfrey came from, yeah, her story is incredible. She's extraordinary, the wealthiest woman in Hollywood. To come from nothing in Southern America to, to develop herself into what she has, incredible, extraordinary. Beyonce, one of the number one, she, I think she's the number one selling female artist in the world. It, pretty amazing, at least in America, but maybe the world. Tom Brady, again, when we look at him, the most amount of Super Bowl present performances ever, most amount of Super Bowl wins. So we look at these individuals and, and this is sort of what society says is extraordinary. But I want you to think about some other individuals, individuals in your everyday world, and even individuals in your own home that also all have extraordinary stories. And as I mentioned, I'm gonna share with you the three principles to help you really express your extraordinary self. The first principle is purpose. And purpose can be defined as the reason why you do something and the reason you do what you do to serve others. I'm going to start out with a story about a young African girl who was in college. She was in college and her parents asked her to come back home. So they said, we heard that you were wearing a short skirt. Now, when she tells a story and you have to listen to her story online, you can find this online. I'll give, her, give you her name in a moment. She said the skirt was barely above her knees. So it wasn't like a mini skirt like girls wear today. So she said it was barely above my knees. So for the three days, her parents asked her to come home. Her father, she said there was no TV, no computer, no internet, no phones. So they just had a talk. So they would stay up late talking every night. And the last night, the mother comes out as a father, as a young woman's talking to her father. And she says, have you talked to her about what we brought her home for? So, so then the father's like, so Immaculate, I want you to really connect with your religion. She was Catholic. I was raised Catholic as well. I want you to connect with your religion, with God, to do your, say your rosary, to connect with Mary, to really get closer because I will not be here forever to be by your side, to protect you, to guide you. So she's like, okay, that's great. That's awesome. So she goes back to school. Now, fast forward to April of 1994. She's back at school. She has Easter break or spring break. Her parents say, oh, Immaculate, this is spring break. We want you to come back home with us. You're our family. We want our family together. Now, being the college kid, right? You, you, we've all been in college or many of us have been in college. Yeah, we want to hang out with our friends and do the friends things. So she goes back home. And during that time, all 900 kids in her class were slaughtered because it was a time of genocide in Rwanda. She gets back home, she wakes up one morning and her brother's waking her up. And her brother says, have you heard, what are you doing sleeping? You need to get up. People are being slaughtered in our town. So Immaculate goes and hides. Her mother, her father, her two brothers were all slaughtered. 500,000 to a million Rwandans were slaughtered by fellow Rwandans, people they lived in the same community with. Immaculate hid in a closet for 71 days. The closet was three by four. It wasn't even a closet, it was a bathroom, three by four with seven other women. Three by four is about the space that I'm standing in here right now with my TV. For 71 days, they hid in this bathroom protected by a local pastor. At one moment, I remember hearing the story as she was telling the story that the guard, that the soldiers were looking for her because they were going to slaughter her. And they went into the pastor's where she was hiding. And they went to the pastor and, this, and they're like, what's inside that door right there? And he's like, oh, nothing, it's just the bathroom. He went to put his hand on the doorknob and something stopped him from turning that doorknob. And he walked away and left and they survived. The seven women in that bathroom survived. Immaculate wrote a book called Left to Tell. And so obviously you can imagine the horror, the anxiety, the, the worry, the, the depression, the guilt of surviving this when her whole family was slaughtered except for one brother who was away at school, her community, her town. But she said in that closet or in the bathroom, she communicated with God, she prayed to God and God communicated to her that this is going to be all right, that you have a powerful message to tell that you have a purpose 
She wrote the book Left to Tell to give us all a very important message about peace, about forgiveness, about love. So as you go through your day, as you go through the days coming up and the weeks and the months and the years, there's a lot of forgiveness. There's a lot of healing. There's a lot of conversations that we'll, we will need to have. Remember that you, you need to be on purpose with everything you do in your life. There's, there's time to be fun. There's time to just hang out. But you have to be on purpose with what you do. You were put here to be on purpose. And it's up to you to discover what that purpose is. And many times, life gives you events to help you direct to what your purpose is. I love this quote by Dr. Martin Luther King, one of my favorite quotes. He said, use me, God. Show me how to take who I am, who I can be, and what I can do, and use it for a purpose greater than myself. And he was used for a purpose greater than himself. I don't know what he think about what's happening today, but I know that he was used for a purpose greater than himself. So as you think about these words from Dr. Martin Luther King, as you think about your own purpose, whose lives are you serving? What were you here to do? Was it for your children? Was it for your community? Was it for your clients? And I just wanna share a story that my good friend Jackie gave me the honor. One of the things that, one of our goals that Janice and I had when we started the Institute for Integrated Health and Fitness Education was to empower, to inspire, to educate, to up-level the education of health and fitness professionals. I started out as a personal trainer over 22 years ago before, when I was in chiropractic college. And I'm very, this, this field is very personal to me, it's very important to me, and I, and I love this field, and this is why we teach so much to this field. So it's important to us that we give back to this industry because I believe, I just, not, not even I believe, I know you are the solution to the healthcare crisis, that you transform lives. And this is a picture of Jackie and I and her client, Lillian. Lillian came up to me last time, Jackie had hired me to come down and do consultations with her and her team down in Houston, Texas. My sister lives outside of Houston, so I go down there quite frequently, and she hired me to come in and do a consultation. Now, Lillian came up to me, and she's like, hey, Dr. Osar, I was at your talk in May. Jackie had me in May, and then I was back there this past July. And she's like, I was at your talk in last May, and I just want to say the stuff you were teaching about the foot was so excellent. Jackie's been working with me with my balance. I had a fall, and, I, and she had lost everything after Hurricane, I think it was Katrina. Just, um, I apologize if, if that's the wrong hurricane. But after Hurricane Katrina hit Houston, she was devastated. Everything was lost, her home, her, everything she owned, her and her husband. She had also had a history of falling. She had been through physical therapy, and she, the physical therapist had given Lillian Jackie's name. And she's like, now she was walking. She walked right up to me. She scooted right up. She's 75 or so years of age. And she's, she's like, when I came in, I could barely stand up. I could barely walk with a cane. And here she was scooting. And she, had, she said, Jackie was there for me after the hurricane. Jackie was there for me to give me my balance back. She gave me my life back. And she's like, I want to thank you for helping educate her. And, and this is why Janice and I do what we do. We tirelessly give away so much information. We travel around the world teaching this information because we can't reach everybody, but we know that you have people in your community, just like Lillian, that need to hear your message, need to know your mission, your purpose. So please define your purpose. And if you could please, just write it into the chat box because I, I, I can't read it right now, but I wanna read it later on. I wanna know what your purpose is if you do know it. If you don't know, know it, just put it in there. Hey, I don't know what it is, but I'm going to work on it. Because once you get clear on your purpose, now you know why you get up every single morning. Those cold mornings, those dark mornings, those tired mornings, when there's chaos going on in the world, you know why you got up in the morning. So again, I wanna thank you for all you do for our community and the people that you serve and the people that you're going to serve after this weekend. Now, there's a couple things in life. There's not much that's uniquely yours. You own several things, three things in particular, that are uniquely yours. So this is principle number two. So two things that are very unique to you that nobody else in the world has, okay? No one has these two things, your particular iris and your particular fingerprint. No one in the world can duplicate your iris or your fingerprint. There is one more thing that's very important to your success, to being extraordinary, and that is your story. And it's not just your story, it's your personal story. And here's what I mean by personal story. Karen is one of our certified integrated movement specialists. 
Karen is also now on our teaching team and we have the pleasure of having her and very awesome individuals just like Karen. And Karen graciously allowed me to share her story. When Karen was a teenager, she was in college and she was a high level softball athlete. She was, she was on the college softball team. At some point during her college career, she started to notice she was getting a little more fatigued. She was getting a little more tired. She wasn't as strong as she once was. Her parents took her to a doctor after doctor. Her, her father actually, she says, he, he regrets ever saying this. She's like, he's like, oh, it's just all in your head. You just gotta toughen up. Finally, they took her to the doctor and she had stage four cancer. And a rare form of cancer that attacked her lung and respiratory system. She was giving, the, the doctor came out and told her parents, give her her last rites, she will pass away. And she survived. And then she started to recuperate. And about a year or two later, the cancer came back again. And again, she was told, the parents were told to use the, give her the last rites. And again, she said in her mind, she said, because I asked him like, what, what gave you the strength to carry on when you had this incredible diagnosis and you thought you were going to die, your parents, the doctors, everyone thought you were going to die. She's like, two things. Number one, I set a very powerful goal. I said, I want to get out of here and run a marathon. And the second thing she said, somebody gave me a spiritual quote that I read every single day. She, she said it was a powerful goal and it was my faith that got me through it. Now, Karen, and she was told, she was also told as she survived, obviously she, she, she survived, and she was told she would never have children. And here she is with her two beautiful children. She, you know, I've, been, I've had the pleasure of being able to work with this young girl. She's going away to college on a college scholarship as well, sports scholarship. Uh, it's just a wonderful, wonderful story of survival. Now, many of you are afraid to tell your stories, and, and with good reason. For years, I haven't told my story. And what I want to express to you is people need to hear your story. And I see somebody come through, my purpose is to empower women. Absolutely, women need empowerment. People need to hear your story. And I, I wanna share one more story with you. My best friend, Peter, Peter and I have been best friends since we're 20 years of age. We met at a health food store in New Jersey where I grew up and I was manager, he became assistant manager and we've been tight ever since. Um, Peter served 25 years as a police officer, it's a topic for another conversation another day, but I love and respect people that give their lives to protect us. I knew Maria, obviously, because they were dating their high school sweethearts. And Maria was always a little overweight. She didn't really, she wasn't an exerciser. She didn't really watch her weight or her what she ate. She was always a beautiful woman, as you can see in this picture here from her, from last summer. Now, Maria, I was driving in 2018, I was driving to my nephew's funeral. I was out in, in California at a conference with Janice and I got a call from my sister that my nephew had committed suicide. I was on a, I went, jumped on a plane, was driving down to Kentucky to go to, to, go to my nephew's funeral. And I got a call from, from my other best friend that Maria had cancer, and, and breast cancer. And I called Maria and, and, and I never called, I literally had never called Maria on the phone. And I'm like, Maria, I'm so sorry I heard. And, and she's one of those women, she is tough. She gets on a bus at like four o'clock in the morning, goes into the city, works all day, comes home. She's with her kids until she goes to bed. She's up working late. Um, so she's one of these tough women. And she, she just had a resilience in her voice. And I knew that no matter what happened, she was gonna get through this. Obviously she was scared. Obviously there was a lot of unknowns at that time. Um, in the process, she ended up having a bilateral mastectomy going through, she didn't have to go through chemo or radiation. She had a lot of reconstruction, a lot of pain. And recently I was talking to Maria because during COVID she lost her job. And I just checked in with her. I'm like, yeah, how, how, are, how are you doing? And she, she said to me, she's like, I feel like I've, I don't know what my purpose is. And, and she had asked me, she had texted me earlier and she said, what do you think about me going into fitness? Because now she had really transformed her life. And this is Maria now. She lost over 50 pounds. She eats healthy. She's helping her, client, her, her family eat healthier now. She's completely transformed her life. And she's got a new energy exuberance. She's posting all over Instagram. Just good stuff, good healthy things. And I'm so happy for Maria that she's come through this. And as, as we were talking about this presentation, I'm like, Maria, I want to hear your story. Like, what gave you the strength? And, you know, what is your next step in life. And she's like, I don't really know. You know, like I want to do something with fitness, 
but who would listen to a 50 year old woman that, that has never been in fitness and is starting to once again into personal training. And I said, let me share something with you, Maria. You've shared with me how there's so much frustration. There's so much anxiety about going through the whole, the whole process of all the pre exams going into the cancer or, or going into your surgery, the mastectomy surgery, all the after the surgery, all the pain, all the drugs and medications, the not being able to move around or do your job or care for your family, the uncertainty. She would go to these support groups, these cancer support groups, and she just felt like she didn't fit in. And I said to Maria, I'm like, I have been in this industry for 22 years. I've written books. I've traveled and spoken all over the world. People look to me as an expert. But let me ask you something. If I have a website, which we, which we do, we have a website, and a woman that has cancer and she's middle aged in her 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s, any age, she's looking for help. She's looking for answers. She's looking for support. She comes and sees my website. Oh, this guy seems pretty smart. He seems knowledgeable. And then she comes to your site and she sees your story of struggle. She sees how you're strong, empowered, and educating other women who've gone through this process. Who is she more likely going to follow? I'm like, Maria, you need to tell your story. You need to empower, educate, and enroll other women. Let them know that they're not alone, that they're not crazy with what they're going through. Because she said, I would spend days in my bed just crying, felt alone, even though her husband was there. You know, her kids were there. But I'm like, other women are experiencing this too. They need to hear your story. So as you think about your own and develop your own personal story, because you have one, you have stories, you have your personal story, share it with your clients. They need to hear that you're a real person because they hold you on a pedestal. They, they look up to you. They think you're invincible. They, they already think you're extraordinary. They know you're extraordinary. That's why they're with you. That's, that's not maybe why they came, but that's why they stay with you because you are extraordinary. Share your personal story because your clients need to hear that. Your potential clients are looking for leaders just like you. And the best thing you can do to differentiate yourself from everyone else in the industry, because let me ask you a quick question. If I asked you, are you super passionate about what you do? Just raise your right hand. Even if you're at home, raise your right hand if you're super passionate about helping people, okay? Let me ask you another question. Are you, do you over deliver on your services? Do you give more than, than you say you're gonna give with your clients? Of course you do. That's why you're here. That's why you're part of Functional Aging Institute. Do you, do you really give all you got to your clients? Do you think about your clients more than you think about yourself? Because I know many of you, Jackie, for example, myself, for example, we risk our own health, or, or, or I should say, we don't take care of our health because we're so concerned with the health of our clients. So how many of you do that? You don't eat right, or you don't exercise enough, or you don't sleep enough because you're worried and you're, you're serving your clients. Yes, so all that cannot be what differentiates you from your competition. The one differentiator from you and everyone else there in your community, in the industry, is your personal story. So please, once you define your purpose, develop your personal story. So here's how you start to develop your personal story. You just write down everything that comes to mind about your life because you're going to see things that happen in your life. And if you don't write it down, you won't, you'll forget some of these things. And I just want to share something with you just so you can, so to give you kind of an idea. I was born in 1969. I know I don't look that old. <laughs> I was born in 1969 in Trenton, New Jersey, the capital of New Jersey. Not a great area, but I was born to an 18 year old Italian woman and my father was black. So I know what it's like to be a black man in America. I was put up for adoption. And I remember reading a story, uh, a letter that I was put in a foster home around the age of one or two, between the ages of one and two. And the family were like, this is such a sweet young boy and sorry. And they wouldn't let them adopt me because they wouldn't let them adopt me because they were too old. They were considered too old. They were 40 at the time. They were considered too old. So I was adopted by my mother and father who have since passed. And I was adopted into a family, an Irish Catholic family, super Catholic. And they already had six kids of their own. They had five girls and a boy, and they adopted me. And when I was adopted, these are, these are five of my six sisters. The other sister we don't talk to, or this, I just, <laughs> we, I we don't talk to her. She doesn't talk to us. Um, so this is my oldest sister. My next, uh, she's somewhere in the dead. <laughs> what? They were, they were quite a bit older than me. So my sister, Sylvia, is the only sister that didn't have children. She was my godmother. So when I was baptized. She was my godmother. 
And I know that I was born to a woman. I was adopted by a woman, but she was the mother I was supposed to have. And I was the son that she was supposed to have. Oh boy. Okay. Now, you say, oh, Dr. Russell, you're real emotional. I'm blaming the fact that I grew up with six girls in the house, a dominant mother, and a female dog and a female cat. So there's a lot of estrogen in the house when I was growing up and developing, so this is why I get so emotional. But she was the mother I was destined to have because my mother was not an empowering woman. She was not like, hey, I mean, you can do anything you want. You're awesome, you're extraordinary. She was not that woman. In fact, she, she would much rather tell us all the things we didn't do well. We would sit at the dinner table and if we weren't getting yelled at, we sat in silence. And the one bright moment of my young life was the, the week or two I got to spend with my sister because it wasn't like that. She talked, she listened, she supported me. She's like, Evan, you can do anything you want in your life. I know that she was a woman that was supposed to be my mother and I was a son that she was supposed to have. And yes, I actually did have hair at one point in my life. <laughs> Now, at 16 years of age, I was the same height as I am now. You see my big old noggin here. So I weighed 120 pounds. So for my birthday, my sister got me this book, the Arnold Schwarzenegger, Encyclopedia of Modern Bodybuilding. So 1984, I think I was 16 years of age. Arnold Schwarzenegger was, was you know, all over Hollywood. He was the, at the time, the reigning Mr. Olympia, the, the most amount of Mr. Olympia wins. So I followed his routine and I did, I got big and stronger. But I also grew up on a farm. And I never got injured growing up and working on a farm, cutting firewood, you know, chickens and gardening and all that until I started lifting weights. So as I look back at my life, this book changed my life because it got me into working out. It got me interested in the body. It got me injured. That got me interested in going to physical therapy and learning other things to do with my body besides medication and just going to physical therapy. So we, as you're looking at your own personal story, think about these sort of moments because these are transitional times in your life that ch forever changed the trajectory of your life. I came across another individual around that time. I, so when I graduated high school, I moved in with that, my, my godmother, Sylvia, so, to go to college. So I was working full time, going to school part time. I took the easiest major I could possibly find, recreation and leisure. And why did I take that major? Because it sounded cool. I'm like, recreation and leisure. I'm going to do some recreation, recreating and leisuring. But mostly I took it because there was only one math and, and or one science class. And the two subjects I hated the most were math and science. In fact, I hate, you know, I'm, I'm sort of embarrassed to say this, but it's part of my story. I cheated my way through math and science in high school. I, I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't, I was a decent student. I got decent grades, but not great. So in the gym, I met my buddy who was at the time, Became, he ended up becoming my best friend, Mike Grant. He's also a chiropractor in New Jersey. I asked Mike Grant, I'm like, what are you going to school for? Because we were both going to Mars Community College in Jersey. He said, I'm going to school to become a chiropractor. So I'm finish, finishing up my last few classes before I transfer out to chiropractic college. I'm like, what are you taking this semester? He's like, biology. So I'm like, I didn't really know anybody. I just, I had just recently moved back to Jersey. We, I was in Jersey, moved to upstate New York, moved back to Jersey. I didn't really know anybody. So Mike was really, Mike and Pete were my, my, my two only friends at the time. So I'm like, it'd be kind of cool to take a class with somebody I know. So in my head, I'm thinking about what's the, what's the least painful? Cause I need one math and one science to graduate. So I'm like, what's the least painful class I can take? So I'm like, I hate math. I just can't do math. Uh, I'll take biology. So he was taking biology. I took biology and Again, another pivotal moment in my life. Mike went home and studied, and I would go over to his house on my days off, and we'd study together. And it sounds odd, but I never understood that smart people study. I thought smart people were, you were either smart or you weren't smart, or kind of smart, but you weren't, weren't really smart. I had no clue up to that point, all through Catholic school, grade school, and public high school. I never knew that smart people study. Like it was, it was mind blowing. I'm like, you study a lot. He's like, yeah, I have straight A's. I mean, that's what you do. So I sat, he taught me how to study. Remember, I cheated my way through high school, chemistry, high school science, high school math. Out of a hundred kids in the biology class, which was the hardest class on campus because it, it was sort of part of the pre-med program. I got the second highest grade. I got like a 96 in the class because he taught me how to study. He took the time and that class, changed my life. 
I changed my major that moment after that class to pre-med. I ended up going off to school to finish my bachelor's. I was going to go to medical school. My buddy was out of chiropractic school. He talked me to that. Changed my life. And I just texted him this morning. I'm like, dude, I just want to thank you again. You changed the course of my life. So as you're developing your personal story, you have stories just like this. People that came into your life, your life for a reason. Some of them are there to support you and love you and help you along the way, give you that little boost when you just don't feel extraordinary enough to give you that little boost. Other people come in like Mike to change the course, the director, the direction of your life. Other people come into your life to challenge you, to dig you in a whole new different direction. So maybe you've had tragedy, maybe you had a horrific crime happen to you or a situation in your life, domestic or verbal or sexual abuse. Use those opportunities to grow, to learn, to, to help other people who are also struggling with that same situation. So second principle, develop your personal story. It's personal to you. Your clients will stay with you because of who you are and because of your personal story, your journey that you went through to get to where you are right now. Now, I'd be remiss to talk about story without mentioning my wife, Janice. My parents, as I mentioned, were super uber strict. I was not allowed to date. I was very infrequently was I allowed to go out and hang out with my friends. I wasn't allowed to go to my graduation party. I wasn't allowed to go to the prom. I literally had never been on a date until I was 19. In fact, I was so nervous when I started dating girls. Like I would literally either throw up during the date. I'd go to the bathroom and throw up during the date. I'd throw up after the date for years and years. It was a nightmare. And then I started dating some really not great girls. They were, they were nice people. They just weren't great for me. And it was very like high and low relationships. So Janice's story is kind of interesting and, and I'm not going to, going to do it justice, but Janice married her high school sweetheart and she moved, they moved, she moved to support him as he went through college and then law school. They moved to Chicago after law school and then he left her, like literally in the middle of the night, left her after she had supported him through, through college, through law school. And again, to, to imagine that like, she was a Lutheran girl, a, a very strict religious, going, going to religious school as well. It was devastating to her. And when I met her shortly after her divorce, or sort of when she, her divorce was going through, she was my student in massage school. And I was a little scandalous, but we didn't date until after she had graduated. And she had a lot of work to do, unfortunately. She, had, she, she took me on, and I remember asking her out, and I remember the first date, she punched me because I, because I was being such a jerk. I was just a jerk. I, I, I didn't know who I was, and I was trying to find myself. She literally punched me, and I was like, wow, that's a strong punch. I'm like, well, she's like, you're, you're being a jerk. And her friends, like, for the first few dates, you know, I, I just wasn't nice to her. Her friends, like, even when we started dating, like, I broke up with, I broke up with her literally three times. And the last time I broke up with her, she said to me before she walked out the door, she's like, I don't know what your problem is. You like me, but you have some kind of problem. And she walked out the door and that was a very powerful moment for me. And her friends kept asking her, why do you stay with this guy? And I don't know what she said, but she said to me, because I see the potential and who this person can be. I am who I am today from my story, but because she had the patience, the faith and the love to develop and help me, to lift me up, to beat me in the butt when I needed a beating in the butt, to love me when I needed loving, to support me when I needed support. So you also have people in your lives just like this that are meant to also help you bring out your extraordinary self, to believe in you when you don't believe in yourself. Because it was many years, and when I say many years, I can tell you, quite honestly, it hasn't been until this year that I truly believe in myself now. 51 years of age, and then only in the last few months do I truly believe in myself and my abilities and what I'm put here on this earth to do. I don't know if this is my final story, but I, but I know like what I'm here to do right now. And it's because of Janice and it's because of my history. If, if my mother had been more supportive and nurturing, I probably wouldn't be where I am right now. But because I struggled so much with depression and anxiety and worry and just being angry at the world, it put me on my journey and the God sent the right people into my life to help me be the extraordinary person that I've developed myself into. So as you're developing your story, remember and just write down, even, even if you don't think it's significant, write down those people in your life that have been there for you, to support you, to empower you, to lift you up 
and also the ones that have challenged you because there's those people in your life that maybe weren't such great people or maybe they were great people, but they did bad things. Also put them down because they were also instrumental in your story, in your journey. The last key, and we're wrapping up here just in a few minutes. The last key is when Super Bowl teams, I should say, when NFL teams, the sport, the only sport I follow is the NFL. And there's things I don't like about the NFL, but it's my sport. I love football. It's the only sport I can follow and, and, and will dedicate time to. The ultimate goal in the NFL is to win the Lombardi Trophy, to win the Super Bowl. Every team goes into training camps. So training camps will open here pretty soon. So I'm super excited there'll be football this year. <laughs> so every team goes into training camp to, for one goal, to win the Lombardi Trophy. Now, how many teams? There's been 54 Super Bowls since the beginning of the Super Bowl back in, I think, 1960-something. How many teams of the 32 NFL teams have actually won the Super Bowl? So they all have the same goal, but which one, how many have actually won the Super Bowl? Well, the 32 teams, only 38, most 76% of the Super Bowls have been won by 38% of the teams. So very few teams actually win the majority of the Super Bowl. So everyone has the same goal, but only a few win the majority of the Super Bowls. And if you look at business, if you look at life, if you look at any competition, the NBA is very similar to this. The Major League Baseball is similar to this. I bet you if you look at soccer or football across the rest of the world, it's probably very similar to this. Most teams have a goal of winning, but what they don't have is they don't follow the right process. If you look at the teams that win and continually win, like the 49ers back in the 80s, the Dallas Cowboys in the early 90s, and now the New England Patriots, they all have a very specific process about how they carry on their activities. If you look at any successful business, there's a very specific process or a set of systems that they use. And one of the books I recommend to everyone is it's one of the most in instrumental books I've read in the last few years. It's, it's Atomic Habits by James Clear. And I love the quote that's on the inside cover of Atomic Habits. And here's what he says. You don't rise to the level of your goals. You fall to the levels, the level of your systems. You don't rise to the level of your goals. You fall to the level of your systems. And one of the things I can look back at my career now, so 22 years of doing this, most of 22 years of doing, being a chiropractor, being an educator was very frustrating. And Janice can tell you, I spent a lot, she spent a lot of time talking me off ledges for being worried about me. But I, I, I spent the last couple of years angry. She's like, I'm physically afraid of you, Evan. You're so angry. And now I understand why I was so angry. Number one, I didn't understand my personal story and what I was put here to do, truly. And number two, I didn't have systems in place to work myself through my business, my education, as well as work with my patients. That's all changed now. It's a continual process of developing my systems, but now I'm system oriented, I'm process oriented. And all of a sudden, for the first time, like I'm excited to come here and work with patients, like truly excited. I'm excited to, to educate people, like truly excited on a whole entire new level because I'm clear about my purpose. I'm getting more clarity around my personal story. And I understand the power of systems and processes. Yesterday during our pre-con, Robert Lincoln and I, who's become a great, great friend of mine, who I met through the FAI and the Functional Aging Summit, introduced by Jackie Bachmeyer um, last year. The reason I love him so much, also because he's bald, my bald brother, but is because he's a very system-oriented person. And even though we may disagree on a couple things, for the most part, we're right on key with each other and we're both about systems and processes. So the last thing I want, want you to leave with is develop your system or processes or borrow or steal legally, steal somebody else's system and processes and use it until you develop your own. Because until you have a system or processes, you'll spend your time being frustrated by not being able to help clients to the best of your ability because you're just kind of fumbling around, throwing something against the wall, hoping it sticks. So develop your system, develop your processes. This goes through every aspect of your life because the same process that you use to create a successful business, you're going to teach that process to your clients. Because one of the things that your clients struggle with is follow-up, accountability, 
of the understanding of what to do outside of your sessions. And that's why so many of us are frustrated because we know we can help our clients. We know we can transform lives, but our clients just don't follow the process. So what I want you to also do as you're developing your own systems and processes is get your clients on board with your process. If they don't want to get on board with your process and systems, you need to move them along because you will be frustrated wasting, spending your time and wasting your time with those individuals that don't want what you have to offer, that want to make excuses, that don't want the accountability, that don't want to change their lives. And you'll, you'll waste your time and energy and not be able to serve the people who truly you need to bring in and who truly are looking for a leader just like you. So 1%, you want to get 1% better every single day. And I'll give you an example of what this means because people are like, how do you get 1% better? In about 2010, a new coach was hired for this British cycling team. The British cycling team had never won the Tour de France. So in, in 100 years or so, they'd never won the Tour de France. In fact, the bicycle manufacturers in, in stores in England were embarrassed to have Britain, you know, to support the Brit, British cycling team. So this new guy comes in and he did all the usual things. He's like, we're going to look at your diet. We're, we're going to make your diet really clean. We're gonna get you trained. We're gonna make sure you're not overtrained, doing all, all these things with training. We're gonna look at your psychology. We're gonna look at the mindset and psychology. So, the, but everybody sort of does that at that level, right? So that's not really differentiating. But what he did is he went one step further. He's like, if my riders get sick, then they can't train well. And when you think about that elite level, there's not much difference between number one and number two, right? But what if you, are getting sick. So you're missing two, three, four weeks of training a year, but your competition isn't missing those training days. So we had doctors come in and teach the athletes how to wash their hands thoroughly. And this is very relevant, right? For COVID, right? And, and the spread of flu and, and, and germs is he taught them how to wash their hands. So they didn't, so they reduced the risk of getting sick. They were, some people, some of these riders would get road rash on their thighs. So they changed out their shorts. So they didn't, they didn't get road, road rash and can, could, to, could continue cycling hard. He checked out different pillows. What pillow helped the athletes sleep their best? And they would bring the pillows on the trips with them. And he made a prediction or he had a goal within five years, we're going to win the Tour de France. He was a little bit off. They won the Tour de France in two years. So about 2012, I believe the first British rider won the Tour de France. And what's crazy about it is the second year, another British rider won the Tour de France. So, and they won, they, they missed the next year, but they won the following, following one. So no wins in a hundred years. And then they had three wins within four years by 1% improvements. And, and he used the concept or he coined the, con, the concept, aggregation of marginal gains. That's the 1% change. If you can make yourself 1% better each day, work just a little bit tighter on your processes. Look at your clients 1% just a little bit better and differently when you go back to your clients after this weekend. Work on your rest, your mindset, meditate or breathe for 1% better each day. And Denise will show you how to breathe better tomorrow during her session on breathing for posture for performance. So do the things, look at your life and find the areas that you can improve upon 1%. And within a year, 1% is exponential. Okay? so. The last key, process. Develop your process, which is part of your systems. Hone your systems, get people enrolled in your systems. And if people don't wanna get enrolled in your systems, it's time for them to move on. Doesn't mean they're bad people, doesn't mean you're a bad person. There's a better person for them because you need to bring other people into your system that wanna get on board, that want that accountability, that need that transformation that you're going to provide for them. Okay, so that's a British cycling story. The last thing I'll leave you with is Obviously one of the greatest athletes of our generation, Michael Jordan, maybe of all time was Michael Jordan. And I love what he said, you know, he said, people are always competing against me. He's like, I'm not competing against anyone. I'm competing against myself because people are competing where I am right now. I'm competing with myself and I'm already up here. So they're competing with who I was yesterday. I'm competing with who I am today, which is already beyond where those other people are competing with. And that's why he was the greatest of all time although we could argue that, no, he was, he was the greatest of all time. It was because what he did up here and what he did with the systems and his processes 
Another book that I love and I recommend is Relentless by Tim Grover. Tim Grover was Michael Jordan's trainer, and he talks about the mindset of Michael Jordan. That's what made him great, but it was also his process, how he trained himself every single day. He trained harder than anyone on that team, and he helped everybody else rise up. That is you. That's how you be extraordinary. That's how you be a leader, is you make yourself better every single day, and you elevate the people around you, your team, your clients, your family, your community. So I saw the sign on my buddy's, in his, my, my buddy's workplace, don't wish, wish for it, work for it. And again, people right now, they wish for a lot of stuff. They're not willing to work for it. You're here because you're willing to work for it. You've invested your time, your energy, your money to make yourself better. You understand this, but also hold your clients accountable that they must work for it. Don't talk about the process with them initially. Talk about what they can become and what they need to do. They have to put in time. They have to put in work. They have to do the work that's necessary to be extraordinary, to get the results. Don't accept anything less from your clients, okay? Finally, again, I encourage you to go listen to her story on YouTube, read her book, Left to Tell. And one of the things she, Immaculate left us with, and, and I think, if you think about why was she left alive when a million people were slaughtered, she said, why do you, you know, somebody asked her, why do you think the genocide in Rwanda happened? And she said, simply, we forgot how to love each other. And when we look at what's happening in the United States today, we've forgotten how to love each other. So as you go back to your communities, don't go back and just facelessly write on Facebook and Instagram and all your posts. Get out there, love someone, and make a difference. Words are just words. Back up your words with actions. If you want to see the change, then be the change. Go do something to be the change. If you don't like something in your world, in your life, in your community, be that change. Love each other. Let's empower each other. Let's educate our clients. Let's uplift our society, our community, and let's make this world a better place. Let's go be extraordinary. Process, purpose, and your personal story. Let's go do this. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Let's make it a great weekend now. Okay. Um, we've got about 10 minutes for questions. That was, that was tremendous. I'm trying to compose myself because you, uh, you have me emotional as well. I, I have seen her speak live, and it's uh, tremendous if you have not heard her share her story uh, of the Rwanda genocide. It's, it's powerful. Um, Thanks so much for your keynote, Evan. I honestly don't think we could have kicked off uh, the event better. Uh, these are uh, obviously unusual times we're in. Um, we're going to take some questions. Um, uh, overwhelming applause and positive comments come in. This was fantastic. I've already heard from several people that you got them crying and people have to speak here in 15 minutes and they're now all emotional. So um, hopefully you got people fired up, inspired to to bring their best the rest of the day. Um, Michelle says, yay, uh, Beth, Evan, you're amazing. Beth Pelton, thank you, Evan, I'm so pumped. Um, the chat box was overwhelming, Evan, and um, I'm gonna, gonna save that and share that with you because uh, people typing their purpose in um, was just tremendous. I mean, from empowering women to empowering people over 60 to you know, purposeful life and just, I mean, so many just tremendous things. So. Um, Great, great stuff there. So um, I'm going to try to moderate the Q&A box. So if you can find the Q&A box at the bottom and type your question in for Evan, uh, we'll do questions for about 10 minutes. Um, and then we're going to take a break, just like you would at a conference. Um, so you can hop on Facebook and chat. You can go to the virtual expo. You can go to the restroom. Um, and the next session start live at 1130. Uh, so don't wander, don't wander for too long because they do start at 11:30. So um, let's see what kind of questions we've got for you, Evan. Um, Danielle asks, "What are your best uh, how-to study resources?" Um, how to study? Yeah, I'm not sure <laughs> if she's asking how to to like do stuff or how to study. Um, <laughs> Not exactly sure. So you do have to be really precise typing your questions into the chat. Uh, here's one thing. I, again, this is another part of my story I didn't, I didn't share because as you start developing your personal story, you're going to remember all these things. And I sort of forgot about it until you just asked that question. 
when I wrote my first book, Corrective Exercise Solutions, it took me two years to write. My publisher was super patient and he's an awesome man. He's, he's, he's actually one of the greatest men yeah. I've ever Yeah, Danielle was saying to learn better like you did. I mean, you yeah, became, yeah, yeah, a, better, yeah. you became right. a better learner. How'd you do that? Perfect, perfect. Um, so when, again, so when I wrote my first book, Corrective Exercise Solutions, it took me two years and there was something wrong with the book. Like I wasn't happy. I got lots of great acclaim about the book. People like, oh, I love this book. It's great. You know, it got me a lot of speaking gigs around the world, um, places, you know, S South Korea, we, we just went to recently, um, would never gone there without the book, but I knew there's something not right about the book and I couldn't put my finger on it. I had a patient that came in a, about 10 years ago. So, so after the book came out. And she said to me, so it wasn't 10 years ago, it was like six years ago. Um, she said to me, oh, that's just your ADHD. And I'm like, what do you, I'm like, what, what? She's like, oh yeah. She's like, oh, I thought you knew you had ADHD. I'm like, no. She's like, yeah, your book's all over the place. You know, you, you know it, it doesn't really make sense. It's a great book, it doesn't make sense. So, she's, she's, so then she emails me later on that day. She's like, oh, I thought you knew, I'm so sorry. I would have never said that to you. But I'm like, no, no, what's this ADHD thing? I thought there's just like this, this thing that's in your head that people just make up because you know, you, you're, not, you're not so smart or something like that. But she sat down and she explained to me what ADHD is. And I'm like, holy cow, this is exactly, exactly what was wrong with the book. And now I can look back when I read the book now, I'm like, oh, this is awful. But what she did it is, here's a couple of things. I, I, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you a couple of hints that she gave me. Number one, I used to write Right with the TV on and music on, and she's like, "No, you got to be in, a, in your in your room, TV off, phone in the other room, so you don't hear the buzzing, the texting, and all that. You need to be quiet. So you need to block. So that was the first thing. Number two, you need to block out time. I'll just like write, you know, let me go right here, and I'll just sit there and do nothing and just think about things and look around. So like, you need to block out time. So in your schedule, you need you need, to have, you need to block out time, specific time that you're going to do work on systems or processes or learning or reading that nothing else can be scheduled in that time because you've blocked that time out. It could be 15 minutes, it could be 45, it could be an hour, it could be two hours, but you have to schedule it, you have to block it out. The next thing is you have to create outlines or templates of how you're gonna do things. And I was never an outline person. I remember in school, create an outline. I'm like, I don't know how to create an outline. This seems stupid. I just wanna go do things. So that's why I would just sit there aimlessly because I had no outline. I was just, I was just thinking about like, oh, I feel like writing about the foot. So I'd write something about the foot. Okay, now I feel like you're writing something about the shoulder. Go write something about the shoulder. No, no, no. Outline it so that way you're very specific about what you do and when you do it. And if you can't, if you get stuck, then just put it away and walk away. Just, just go do something else. But, but again, quiet, no computers, no texts, no one can bother you. Put a sign on your door that says closed in session or something so nobody, your family knows not to bother you, your kids know not to bother you, your, your significant others, your dog doesn't, knows not to bother you. Be quiet, get time alone, Block time out so, so nothing else gets scheduled in there and then create an outline or a template and then use that template, work that template, modify that template until it works for you. And now you have a system because now I can go and write because I know that I, I have my, my template of how I, I organize myself to write my book. So those are, those are my biggest keys that I can give you right off the top of my head. Okay, so we're getting several comments, questions about, uh, I think it's Immaculate is how you say her name. Um, do you have a, a website or a book reference that you recommend? Um, her book is called Left to Tell. So if you, just, tell. if you just type in Left to Tell on, on Amazon or YouTube, you'll find her. She's, she's all over. Yeah, great, great. Um, <clears throat> man, lots of comments here. Um, Dr. Osar, so impressed by your humility. Thank you for sharing your story. I mean, honestly, I, I Look, I, I mean, I thought of you as, you know, sort of a leader in the industry when I met you in 2015, and you're telling me back then you hadn't really found your confident footing? Literally, it was, it was during COVID, and I can honestly tell you that. It was during COVID. I, it's all right. Take your time. I asked the right question. And you're 51 now, right? I remember your uh, your big 50th, your big 50th last year. Hey, Cody's joined you. Cody's now 50 as well. Um, and, and Cody was was pretty introspective when he said, "Man, you turned 50," and you're like, um, "This is pretty interesting." Janice's brother just got fired from his job. He's turned 50 a few weeks ago. He's going through a midlife crisis as well. So there's something about turning 50. Um, um, so during COVID. 
our business was shut. I took the last year off because Janice is like, you're so angry. You, you, you just take the year off. Um, so I mostly took last year off and I did, I still did some writing, some teaching and things like that, traveling. It was a good year. It was my 50th birthday. I, I got to spend, spend it down in the islands with, with great clients who invited us down and hosted us for a week. I got to go to Hawaii with Janice's family to celebrate their 50th, her aunt and uncle's 50th wedding anniversary. So I had a good time, but towards the end of the end of the year, I'm, I'm like, we're, we're in bad financial situation because I took the year off and I'm not, I don't feel rested. I don't feel complete. I don't feel like anything was resolved. So all the issues I still were, was dealing with was still there. It wasn't time. I thought time off was, was what I needed. It wasn't the time off. So during COVID, you know, we were just starting to get going in practice again. People were starting, patients were starting to come back and then COVID hit and now our business is just decimated. And now we're back in the financial crisis. And we were having a situation with our, our building. We were not getting along with the building manager here. Um, he, he basically, you know, he got in my face and I don't want to talk to you or your wife, you, you, you know, and, and you know, Janice, she's the sweetest person. And, and the second time he, he got in my face. So here we are, we're, we're spending $50,000 on rent every year in here. And, and he's telling us he doesn't want to deal with us. Like right now, we, we literally don't have air conditioning. I'm sweat, I'm dripping wet because we have no air conditioning. These, these are the kinds of things that, that we were dealing with. Um, so we needed a lawyer because, because I know I'm like, they're going to do something to us as we leave this building. We need a lawyer to help expedite this process and make sure that we're covered, that we're, we're covered and that they don't try to do something nasty to us on the way out. Well, the lawyer costs $3,500. Now, we have no money coming in. We're, we're, we're living off credit cards. You know, our, our, banks, our bank you know, account is dwindling. And Janice says to me one day, she's like, Evan, last night I prayed to God. I said, give me a sign that we can move out of the space and move into another space. And the next day, there was $4,000 in our account. One of the first of the, of the PPP loans came through. And she's like, I felt like that was a sign from God that it's time to move forward. So I was in a bad place, man. Like I was so angry and frustrated with everything that was going on with COVID and how, how people were handling it. And you know, that's a whole conversation for another time. I wasn't sleeping. You know, I, I was laying in bed, just anxious and my heart racing and just angry. Um, so one night I got maybe three hours of sleep. I woke up at 2 a.m. And I, you know me, I usually wake up around three or four anyway, but I was, I was laying up at 2 a.m. at all <laughs> Yes, I've seen you on Instagram and uh, <laughs> I hear about that. And I get your texts and I'm like, my goodness, he's an hour ahead of me and he's still beating me up. <laughs> so it's like 2 a.m. So I get up, I'm um, doing some work. I come to the office to work out. And I should, have been, I should not have been working out, right? Because I've only gotten two, three hours of sleep. And I remember Janice is like, oh, yeah, I talked to God. And I grew up Catholic, but I wasn't super religious. You know, I, I, I see signs of God and, and, and believe somewhat. And I looked out the window and I was thought about our situation here in our building. We have a whole other situation at home at our condo association that is awful. Janice has been held up by five-year-old kids, not five, eight-year-old kids with guns. We've had her car smashed into last week. She's had her wallet stolen. Like it's, it's a nightmare in our condo situation as well. So it was coming at us from every angle. And I looked out the window and I'm like, God, give me a sign. But I didn't really say it like that. It didn't come out like that at all. Like I was cursing, I was angry. <laughs> and I said, God, man, I've tried so hard to serve and to, and to over deliver and to give. And, and this is more and more, we're not getting ahead. We're not, you know, people, people look up to me as a leader, but we're not being successful at the level that, that I believe we should be. And then, and then I just cried. I just cried for 15 minutes. And then I was laying down on the gym floor, just laying there because I, I was just tired. And I don't know. I, I can't explain what it was, Dan. I can't explain what it was. Something changed. Something all of a sudden changed. And ever since that moment, everything's been different. Everything has been different. My entire mindset. I mean, we're, we're, in, we're on the south side of Chicago right now. I mean, the riots are going on down in our neighborhood. You know, the looting and, and, and the destruction of property. And like I said, you know, somebody smashed into our car last week and just no plates on the car took off. Somebody stole Janice's wallet and ran up all, all the credit cards, stole her cash. I mean, bad things are happening, but I'm resolved, man. I'm coming out of this stronger. We're coming out of this stronger, more resilient. I'm something switched in my head. And I can't tell you what it was. And I talked to my friend who's a psychologist. Um, she's 70 years of age. And she's like, that was the light switch that went off, you know, the spark that you needed 
but it's all the things that you've done over your life up to this point. And that's why I said to say to you about personal story, why it's so important that you look at your personal story and develop your personal story. I couldn't be here right now. I couldn't even have done the speech the way I've done it today. Had this, everything that happened to me in my life not happened. So when I say develop your personal story, please take the time and develop your personal story because sooner or later, just have faith, whether you believe in God or you have faith in another spirituality or the universal universe, believe in something, have faith that it will get better, that things will turn. And you don't know what that moment is when all of a sudden that spark will hit and everything will be different from day on, day, that day on. And I know everything is going to be different. Like COVID saved me, COVID saved me, saved our business. Like I can't wait to get back at it. I and mean, we haven't stopped getting at it, but I can't wait for what's going to happen, you know, post COVID, post this whole situation right now, because of all the things that have, that have you know, led up to this point. So sorry, that was a little long winded explanation. Of <laughs> no, that was great. You needed the, the time to answer. And uh, I think people need to hear it. Um, you know, I think people, um, uh, first of all, people aren't this authentic. Typically, uh, I don't know if you would have even been this authentic live on stage. Um, but you are now. And, uh, and even Cody's saying he can't get back on camera because uh, I think you have him too emotional. Um, and the, the comments coming in on the chat, I mean, people are just like, wow, I never heard this guy's story. I'm a bigger fan of him uh, more than ever, because I think people see you and you're, you're accomplished and you've put out so much written material and so much video and you speak at so many conferences. Um, you know, we need to hear this stuff. Uh, the reality is you're, you're just as real as, as all of us and you struggle with stuff and you struggle with confidence and finding your voice and, and your place. And uh, I tell people all the time, Evan, uh, I'm going to close with this because I, I, we could talk for a long time, but we've, we've got to get to next sessions. I'll close with this. But I, I tell trainers all the time, look, if you've been trained or taken a course or a workshop with Dr. Osar, you're in the top 5% of the industry, right? And you've got to, you got to live that and realize that, right? Like you mentioned Jackie a couple of times, and I know Jackie has struggled with confidence, right? Am I enough? Am I good enough? And can I help my clients? It's like, look, I know you're not going to do it perfect, we're all going to make mistakes with our clients in our businesses and we're going to have times. But if you're learning from someone like Dr. Osar, who's put in the time, I mean, you shared with us, like you had to learn how to become a learner, right? And then you had to learn how to become a teacher and then you had to learn how to become a writer. Um, and so the reality is if we're learning from people like you, we're already in uh, the top of the industry. And so um, I want to thank you for being authentic. I want to again, encourage you to continue to do what you're doing because you're up level in the industry. People need to learn from you. They need to hear from you. Uh, you need to continue to inspire us. So you and Janice both have sessions coming up. Um, I know Janice was in the room there. Um, so uh, you both have sessions coming up and I'm going to uh, see if I can't show that real quick. Hey Janice, how are you? So just real quick, because some people got on late while I was going over sort of the day. We've already had sessions go off this morning. If you've missed them, you can go back and watch them. The Paul Holbrook one really is a blast on uh, power training. Um, the keynote has already happened. And then there's going to be more uh, sessions popping up. Let's see if they already have. Yep. So uh, the 1130 sessions will pop up and you've got the whole schedule. So I'm sure people are going to want to see your session, Evan, and Janice's as well. Um, thanks so much for your keynote, sir. And uh, to everyone else, we're on a break till 1130. We start sharply again at 1130 Eastern time. Thanks again, Evan. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys.